As new aircraft continued to arrive at Edwards, a friendly competition began to evolve between Jaeger and another young flyer, former naval aviator Scott Crossfield. The unofficial prize was the next great goal in aviation, Mach 2. Crossfield was flying the D-558 Phase II, the Douglas Skyrocket, a plane just barely able to go supersonic. With the 50th anniversary of the Wright brothers' first flight approaching, Crossfield wondered whether, with a little work, his plane might not exceed her design specs. Scott Crossfield is a wonderful man, consummate pilot. And at one point in the Skyrocket program, yes, uh, it was apparent that their flight profile might just overlap the Air Force's a little bit. And as Scott will say to this day, all he had to do was just to suggest to his superiors, wouldn't it be nice to whip Jaeger's fanny? The Air Force was planning to uh, fly the X-1A in excess of Mach 2. So that wouldn't be kind of cute if the, if the Navy airplane went Mach 2 first. You know, it'd be kind of cute to bump Jaeger off of his mountain for a day or two because that's all it could last. <laughs> It was a kind of an interesting day. I had the flu very badly and felt like sin, but I wasn't about to give up on this one, one opportunity. We filled the airplane with propellants that we let stand overnight and refrigerated them down to where we get another few pounds in it. We cleaned up the exterior of the airplane and took every protuberance off of it we could. We taped every crack. We didn't know whether this would help or not. If it did, fine, it wasn't going to hurt anything. Fortunately, it was a cold day. The winds were right aloft to give me a little boost going through wind shear at that altitude, and I knew exactly the direction I wanted to go to get that little kick. Crossfield's extra efforts paid off as the Douglas Skyrocket inched just above Mach 2.0. This time, the press was allowed to notice. Scott, he's, you know, he's probably a pretty good pilot. So they got up, up to Mach 2, barely. And uh, 2.005 or something like that. And I think they may have fudged factor a little bit, but that didn't make any difference. Anyway, we're sitting there with the, the X-1A. They're different from the X-1. The X-1 had two and a half minutes of power. The X-1A had four and a half minutes of power. Jack Ridley worked out a profile, said, you drop at 30,000 feet, fire off three of your four chambers, accelerate out to 0.8 Mach, climb to 45, level up 45, fire off fourth rocket, go 1.1, pull the airplane up into about a 50 degree climb angle, and go to 70,000 feet, and at 70,000, start pushing over, level out, and then run the thing till it runs out of fuel. And he said, we, I, I think you can get above 2.3 Mach. And so I went above 70 on the pushover, up to about 78,000 feet, and then, man, we were really accelerating. As I went through 2.3 Mach, the airplane began to yaw. I couldn't understand it. As I looked and said, this is not, not right. I used rudder to try to get the nose back, nothing out, and it yawed it, and finally pitched up. And then it really, really started tumbling. Jaeger was falling out of the sky with all the aerodynamics of a set of keys, locked in a flat spin at more than twice the speed of sound. He blacked out when his helmet cracked the canopy. 80,000 feet to 25,000 feet in 51 seconds and tumbling. And, and finally, I ended up in this inverted spin. Well, spins were a way of life with us. We spun everything. So I flipped it into normal spin and popped it out of the normal spin at 25,000 feet and looked around, I was over to Hatchby. I landed uh, on a lake bed and uh, that was the last flight I made in the airplane. And, and basically that just shows guys with experience can do things that pilots without experience can do. I don't, I don't know why, why Jaeger did that because we all knew that was gonna happen. I, I don't have any idea why he went charging out like that to, the Bell guy said, hey, we don't know what's going on here much above Mach 2 or 2.3. We think we may be running into a stability problem according to wind tunnel data. We had the same problem on the D558 too. All the airplanes of those days configurations would have that so-called supersonic yaw. 
Chuck Yeager had survived the worst the sky over Edwards could throw at him. But as he prepared to move on, a new set of challenges and a new frontier were beckoning. Even as new vehicles were taking shape to carry men there, 